said hello my name is Polly Hart and we're going to be talking today about how to let your story write itself and we have 55 minutes of this good chat and through this um, little little speech presentation I'll give you uh, six different parts seven different story um, write itself there are certain stories uh, this is a short story collection um, there's Oh, I don't know. A lot in here. Here's contents of part one. There's a lot of short stories written in there, and some are flash fiction, some are short fiction, but a story is a story. And when you're writing a story, whether it be a play or whether it be a set of plays, um, Brian's newest book is the uh, no, second newest book, The Haunting Scripts of Bachelor Grove. Yes. Did I say the whole thing perfectly? Yes, you did. Very okay. Very well, and, well. and again, that's writing, risingtide.pub. And, uh, and Tracy has a new play coming out called Angel Eyes, Angel Eyes the, musical. the musical. And uh, you can see uh, show dates for that at Pegasus Eni. Whether it's, whether it's a play or whether it's a, a story or a collection of stories, every story has to have a beginning. You've got to set it up, a middle, and an end. And then sometimes the end can be a tragedy. You can just have the whole thing go downhill. You can have the whole thing go uphill. Or you can have little loops and loops and whatever you want to do. Whatever. That's fine. That's your story. But the story has to write itself, and I'm going to show you how to do that. So part one, your story will write itself if you understand that the goal of writing should be about life fulfillment. And here's a quote by Aristotle. What is the ultimate purpose of human existence? What is the end or goal for which we should direct all of our activities? And this is your story asking you these questions. Everywhere we see people seeking pleasure, wealth, and a good reputation, but while each of these has some value, not all of them can occupy the place of the chief good for which humanity should aim. To be an ultimate end, an act must be self-sufficient and final. Quote, there's that which is always desirable in itself and never for the sake of something else. So that's Aristotle talking to us. Our story through him is talking to us. Our story is calling to us to write it, and it needs to write itself, and we have to put the pen to the paper or the keys to the typewriter or computer no one uses a typewriter and you're like, okay uh, trace uses a typewriter okay so the goal of writing for you should be to help the reader attain life happiness and fulfillment so i'm going to ask you questions and anybody in this room or anybody online uh in the chat bar there can uh chime in uh what makes a good story it speaks to you it speaks to you as a beginning middle and it has a beginning, middle, and an end. Rock, I'm a parrot. Yeah. Okay. There's movement involved. There's movement. Storyline has to move. If it's not moving, it's... If it's not moving, it's... it's not moving, it's dead. It's dead. It's not a story. Paper. Just a piece of paper. You might as well be blank. You might as well have not written that story. Because if it's not moving... The tree died... For a reason, and that was the story. The tree died for a reason. Every every writer has that part, and the, and they'll find it in the middle. And you've got to have something in the middle, otherwise everyone's going to fall asleep. So you've got to keep the story moving. These are called pinch points, and you can learn about those online. But a pinch point is something that happens to your protagonist to get him moving. What happened, Luke Skywalker? Uncle Owen died. Wow, I guess I better go visit Ben. Ben, this was your father's. <gasps> you fought in the Clone Wars. Oh, let's go to Mos Eisley, you know, whatever, the whole story. Uh, what makes a believable story? Different answers. One where the audience is the ever larger world. All right. One in where the audience can find someone to relate to and through their eyes find a larger world. Lewis Carroll, Through the Looking Glass, a perfect example. All right, we all wanted to go through there and see the queen and see uh, Tweedledee and Tweedledum. What makes a believable story? You've got to have good versus evil of some sort. Good versus evil, the clash. Yeah. You've got to have a clash. You've got to have a fight to be believable. And you've got to have somebody that you can relate to. Okay, relatability again, perfect. Okay, so yes, believability. So what makes a believable story is that you believe the story. The writer brings you with him on this journey. That's the old adage, show, don't tell. So I'm going to show you the story. So we're going to put you on our back, and we're going to take you through to take you on this 
story adventure. Because if you if you don't believe it, uh, are you still here? He breaks the wall on purpose because he wants you to know that it could maybe not be believed, but or could it be believed? So he break so when you break the fourth wall, it's bad in a book because they fall out. They're like, wait, what? I don't want to unless they're doing it on purpose, and that's a very specific, different type. We'll talk about that later. Uh, so what, what makes the story easy to read? Or contrawise, what makes the story hard to read? Language. Language? A common everyday language? Whether you're using common everyday language or if you have to go to the stars every five minutes to figure out what they're saying. Yeah, if you have to go look it up. Have you ever read Catch-22 or tried to read Catch-22? Mm -hmm. Horrible, horrible. Right, but it won awards. Well, we don't know why. But yeah, if you have to stop and go... Uh, it, and if it's not in a footnote, and if it brings you up to get away from the story, then you're going to be hurting for believability because you want, I mean, and it's different if, if you're reading a book about Irish people and you got a really, somebody with a really thick accent and you can kind of tell by the writing that they have things that are written in that accent. That's okay for me. But if they're, if the whole book is like that and they're using words and, and idioms and, and colloquialisms, you know, well, that just sounds like another barrel in the fish head. What? Okay, yeah. I threw it. I'm not reading this book. So, uh, now, it, finding out what, we, what we're looking for true happiness, we have to write what makes us happy. And when, when we find through Aristotle, we have to find that goal fulfillment. Um, we also have to understand what makes us unhappy. And I'm going to skip a little bit because I have a little something to talk about what makes me unhappy when i was unfulfilled as and this is in movies because unfortunately today's audience uh, you're going to be more familiar with movies than you are with with books so i took two movies and made myself tell you about how i felt unfulfilled and fulfilled uh the first adventure and unfulfillment is actually two movies back to back thor ragnarok and the uh, the newest one the infinity wars at the end of Thor Ragnarok, Thor Ragnarok, probably the best Marvel movie of this decade. Uh, you have a guy who loses all of his powers, and then suddenly he's like, hey, I am the god of thunder. I'm going to rescue all my people. I'm going to end the world. But you know what? My brother's now my friend. Everything is happy. You've got this. He defeats his sister. He, he, he comes back in union with his dad through a dream. Uh, Asgard is the people and not the place. And then you're thrown into the beginning of the Infinity Wars. And the very first scene is everyone's dead. All of your friends. And Thor has lost all of his power suddenly. And then Loki dies. And so as a storyline, as, as these two join together as a storyline, just through the eyes of Thor, you know, which is the spicing in the infinity wars you were left with i don't know some of the worst fulfillment depth scars pain that you've ever been you know in any storyline i can think of several peter jackson's the hobbit uh, i was left unfulfilled you know he raped the original books um book sorry because he made three movies. So unfulfillment, you and you know what it is because you leave the theater or you leave the sitting reading experience like why? 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 It's like Jack Nicholson walked out at the uh, premiere of the, uh, the, the Return of the King. Jack Nicholson gets up and walks away. Too many endings, he says real loud, and he gets up and walks away. Hilarious. Uh, but, but we know what fulfillment is because we appreciate it when we get there. All of the things that they introduced at the very beginning, Chekhov said, if you introduce a gun in scene one, it's got to go off in scene three. So all the little things that were nagging at the back of your mind. Well, what about Mrs. Milligan's aunt? Oh, she got married to Tom. Oh, ha! Huh. Even that tiny snippet was was tied together, you know. And I can think of a, uh, the Bronte sisters were great about this. You know, everything is tied together. Mrs. Mr. Darcy. Oh, yes, perfect, wonderful. Uh, so we we're left with fulfillment. And as a movie, uh, has anybody seen Memento? Okay, Memento is uh, Guy Pierce. And it's about a man who has short-term memory loss, and the entire thing is filmed backwards, or it's in se backwards sequence with intermittent splices of a forward se secondary scene. 
uh, telling the story. So we end up finding out why the guy dies at the very beginning of the movie, which is the very end of the, of the chronological sequence. One of the most fulfilling movies that I can think of, and as a matter of fact, it's still in the IMDb top 25 of all time. Maybe it's in the top 50 now, maybe it's slipped. So fulfillment, we have to find, as a recap for part one, Aristotle said we have to find the happiness, the life fulfillment in depth and taking our readers along with us um, in, in, in the journey. And if you lose your readers, you've lost your audience. You've lost your paycheck. You've lost your, your reason for writing. Who's going to read your garbage if there's no readers? No one. So he did. He, he brought you along for the journey. Yeah. But then just yeah, decided to sure. when you. Yeah. Yeah, it, it would be like uh, parking in Alexandria, Virginia, giving someone a pair of binoculars and saying, okay, look, there's binoculars. Uh, there's the Washington Monument. There's the White House. There's Congress. Okay, back in the car. I pitched that book across the room with all my might on reading that last page. I, I, I vowed never to read that author. Good, good, because you have to, when you bring your characters along for the journey, at the very end, you have to tell them. Uh, well, I'm, just like I'm doing right now, you tell them where you're going, you tell them as you're going, and then when you're done, you tell them where you went. You have to say, here's what happened all the way through. And you can't leave your people hanging. You have to fulfill all of – it's just like – it's like rape. It's like here's all the sex, but see you later. You're like, well, where's the foreplay? And we, you know, all this stuff. And then, oh, anyway, I, it's a terrible analogy, I know, but it's – it's, it's bad. It's very apt. This case. Uh, that's right. uh, I don't know. That sounds pretty much. I felt pretty violated by that book, so I spent good American money on that book too. Um, Michael Crichton passed away and left a posthumous book called Micro about people who get shrunk, infinitesimal size, uh, and are left out in the jungle. Now he didn't finish the book; someone else finished it for him. But the very beginning, you have some great characters, and then you have a couple of feral individuals who are just there because of the paycheck. Um, but the writer, as soon as Michael's done with what you know Michael's written, he just kind of kills off the main characters and lets the other two guys finish the story. And my wife and I were, you know, uh, listening to this on on when Cracker Barrel still had their return policy on book on tape or book on CD, and we were so angry. We, I found myself speeding. What did he say? <laughs> what are you kidding me? So I was, um, I, I vowed never to read this fella again. Uh, it's like the uh, Robert Ludrum series, uh, The Born Supremacy, uh, and uh, he's got somebody else writing it now. So another series called something else, and he's horrible. And it's just, it's, it's like the Splinter in the Mind's Eye, the first Star Wars novel. It's just so gar, it's garbage, and you don't want to, you don't want to touch it because you can't relate. They don't. They don't take you all the way. They don't pat you on the head and tell you to have a good day. They don't. They don't give you any payoff. Part two. Your story will write itself if you understand the goal of the writer is to present the story. Here's a quote from Stephen King: Writers need to look into themselves and turn towards the life of the imagination. To do so, they should read as much as they can. If they want to be a writer, you must do two things above all others: read a lot and write a lot. He says. Read widely and consistently, sorry, read widely and constantly work to refine and redefine your own work as you do so. Uh, earlier, I was asking Tracy Rosa um, if he, as a playwright, has ever rewritten and rewritten and rewritten and changed. And the answer was, was yes, but, but when, you, when you're done, you're done, right? There was a, there's a finality. There's a difference between a rewrite and a tearing it all up and starting over. Uh, Stephen King, talking about him, he wrote Carrie, uh, and uh, he went through the drawer and said, I'm going to throw this away. His wife said, what are you doing? Don't just lock it up. So he locked it up, I think, for 20 years, and then maybe it was 16 uh, and then it got it out again. He says, okay, honey, help me with this. I don't know anything about teenage girls. I don't know anything about this, this, and this. So she helped him, got him through some stuff. Then he put it out there. Boom. Instant hit. He he was a 
a golden child after after Carrie. But I mean, he had a lot of work to get to that point. But uh, we have to constantly define and redefine and redefine and redefine who we are as a writer. No one is going to take yourself seriously if the story. No one is going to take your story seriously if they do not take. You. If you do not take it seriously, that's the one. That's the one. Thank you. The third time's the charm. Uh, if you are um, writing and you say, I think my opinion is this, that's a mistake because you're the writer. This is your story. The story is telling you and pulling you. You have to let the character say that. You can't, you can't say that to the audience because the audience needs to understand that you are in control of it. It's not maybe. It's always is. Uh, you are uniquely gifted to guide the story into its fullness. Only you know where this story is going to be headed. And you should not let your readers cheat. I mean, if they want to read the back of the, of the book, they're idiots. But they want fence and mystery. Yes, you're taking them on a journey. But what's around the corner? <gasps> Who knows? You know. I know. The writers know. But you have to bring your readers with you. Because you got to pull them. you got to bring them in. You must give the story its ship, and you then you have to give it its sea, and then you have to give it its weather, and the crew, and the final destination. So everything that this story is, you have to give it. Uh, there is there's nothing left to chance. Um, Jack London, uh, he will write 30 pages about how cold it is. I can't do that, but uh, Juliet Marlinier can write 30 pages about a tree. I can't do that. So. Somewhere in there is a balance where you have to find out, okay, should I be talking about this tree or the rabbit that lives underneath it? What's pertinent to the story? Uh, Kevin Smith, who directed Clerks and all of Kevin Smith's things, uh, he got to work with uh, Bruce Willis on um, Die Hard 5, I think it was. Die Hard with a Vengeance is what they called it here in the States. Uh, and so this is his, Kevin Smith's first big film. And so he, he, gives, he gives Bruce a script. He's looking through this part in the script, and Bruce just rips out a page. And Kevin's like, what are you doing? He said, this is Chuffa. And he says, what's Chuffa? It doesn't need to be there. It, you walk into the bar. You say hi to the dog that's there because the old man with the cane brought his dog in. And then you go to the back room to beat up the guy. The blind man and the cane of the dog, Chuffa, throw it out. You have to... Take and cut away what's not necessary. Have you ever had to do that, Brian? Yeah, I've heard that story. Yes. <coughs> yes. And it's true. Uh, as writers, we do have to uh, make sure that every word, every page, everything we do uh, stays true. And uh, that's what the writing is for. He said, serves the cause of the story. Uh, so we have to have a working knowledge of how stories work how a TV show works. And if you want to go watch any Simpsons episode, you can understand how a TV show works. Um, you have the beginning, the main problem. And then you have the second scene with a secondary problem. And then you have a third tertiary problem that works all the way through to the end. And all three problems are resolved usually in some coincidental way. Dumb, 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 dumb. Never write like the TV wants you to. As Stephen King said, if you're just starting out as a writer, your television should be the first thing to go. It's, quote, poisonous to creativity. And it is. Uh, if you're watching, if you're on Netflix, you need to get off Netflix. Just pull the plug. But before you do, watch your favorite movie and pause it right in the middle, right almost exactly in the middle where the red bar meets the gray bar. And you'll find what's happened in the storyline is the main problem has presented itself, the actual main problem. Now, if you do that in a book, you're going to lose all of your audience immediately. In a storyline, <clears throat> you shouldn't have to have all that set up. The, 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 the problem should be about a quarter of the way in, a, a fifth of the way in. And so if you write a book like you're used to watching TV uh, or movies, uh, you're going to fail miserably. So do what Stephen King did. He reads a lot, he writes a lot, he threw away his TV. Cancel Prime, cancel Netflix, it's over. Just do it. If you really are serious about letting your story write itself, um, you don't want to bastardize storyline for a book. You want a, a good storyline that, that, that does what other great books do, pulls you with.
You're a valuable tool. You are the only real tool to create the story. You must present the story in the best possible way. That's the end of part two. And I'm going to take a drink of my tasty Mountain Dew beverage. All right. Part three. Your story will write itself if you submit to the task of letting it daily. Daily. Day off? No, daily. E.B. White says, a writer who waits for the ideal conditions under which to work will die without putting a word on paper. I'll repeat that because it's worthy of repetition. A writer who waits for the ideal conditions. Oh, it's going to be perfect. I'll be there with this and this will be there with that and it'll all work out. And everything's going to be, and, and then the muse will come and hover over me and flow through my arms and we'll, we'll, you know, the great American novel will happen in one day. A writer who waits for the ideal conditions under which to work will die without putting a word on paper. You must sacrifice a set period of your day to do nothing but write. Not prepare for writing, not get ready for writing, not set up to write, not edit your other writing, but write and write only. Not take phone calls about writing, not go get another cup of coffee about writing. Yes, use the restroom because a lot of things are real. You know, don't 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 let it explode. But Besides medical, not if you're slow. It, <laughs> there's flow and there's flow. You like little, those little Japanese boys playing the Xbox. They just have a um, one with Mountain Dew and one with urine. You just don't <laughs> get them confused. But you have to, you have to, have to, have to write every day. Turn off the internet. You can research your story later. Turn off the TV. Why haven't you thrown this away yet? That was part of part two. If you cannot write your story then you need to be writing something. If it's not your story, if you are, if you are stuck, I've got writer's block, you pussy. Write something else. No crosswords, no Sudoku. Write something else. I walked down to the store the other day and got a banana. The reason I got the banana was that I was hungry. Man, I should have given that banana to a monkey. That monkey grabbed my hat and then went up to the tree. I'll tell you what, I called the zookeeper, etc. There you go. Something, something, bam, bam, bam. You've written, just written the newest Curious George novel or whatever, but save it. Save it. Put it in a not put it in a folder that says um, brain thoughts or new things, and that's actually coming up in a second. Uh, you must write, even if it doesn't make sense to where you thought the story was going. You can throw it away during your edit time, but or put it in a different folder. But the way to become a better writer is to continue writing. If you're mid story. You must not take any time to edit. You must do that later outside of your writing time. This is not editing time. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll just catch up. I'll catch up with next, next time. Uh, you need to make sure you're editing before or after your writing time. When you start to write, make sure you're not interrupted. Treat it as you would a visit from a very important dignitary. The states, uh, But I don't have Netflix. My wife has it. Okay. Part four. The story will write itself when it becomes... And this is one that I get yelled at all the time. But in that set time frame, the story is more real than the reality. And here's a strange quote that I'll throw in there from Jesus Christ. Truly, I tell you, said Jesus, no one has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake. And the gospel that will fail to receive a hundredfold in the present age houses or brothers or sisters or mothers or children or fields, along with persecutions, to receive eternal life in this age to come. But many who are liars will first will be last and last will be first. The point is this. If you forsake all of, uh, of, 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 of your extracurricular garbage, uh, catching up on the whatever, catching up on the whatever, catching up on the it doesn't matter, catching up on the garbage, catching up on the BS or whatever, all this extra stuff can be thrown away because there's only two types of people in the world. There's the people who make and there's the people who take. There's the people who create the video games and there's the people who make the video games and uh, play the video games. And unfortunately, there's this amount of people, it's only 1% or less that are making all the stuff. And then there's the 99% over here. Well, I am not the 99%. I'm part of the 1% who is a creator. I'm taking that phraseology and turning it into a different story. But uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a creator, I want to rise above. And uh, Bill Gates is now my peer. Steve Jobs is now my peer, not in the theft department, but the actual intellectual property creation department. You know, okay, so Steve Wozniak, not Steve Jobs. There we go. 
so so I want to be one of the creators. I want to be Dr. Seuss. I want to be Shel Silverstein. You know, I want to I want to redefine this genre. You know, those two specifically for children. I want to be Stephen King. I want to be okay. I'll say it. Dean Koontz, even though most of his novels are the same thing. Man meets girl. Supernatural event. They escape for their life. They have a stalker. Everyone dies except for the girl and the guy. Okay, there's Dean Koontz for you. <clears throat> but uh, but being being part of the small percentage of the creators, you have to be willing. Just like Brian said about getting rid of the stuff, the chuffa that doesn't matter. You have to be willing to take and cut away things from your life that are part of the, if you're American, the normal American experience. You know, you get up at seven to feed the dog, to take the kid to school, to go to work, to come back home and mow the grass and drink a beer and watch the TV for the latest football event and go to bed. Maybe get lucky once a week, twice a month, whatever. Yeah, I don't know. The normal American experience, you know. Okay, once every five months uh, on the anniversary. <laughs> but whatever the case may be, uh, that normal American life has to be has to be broken. There has to be a crack, and you have to see the garbage on the inside and be willing to take the shovel of hard truth and get rid of that stuff, and get rid of. And Tracy knows what I'm talking about, and Brian and Cookie all know what I'm talking about. It's it's tough when you would rather go to bed, but your husband wants you to go to the the writing workshop with them. <clears throat> I love you, Cookie. Thank you for coming. You can you don't have to cover your mouth when you yawn. That's okay. It's a very warm room. Uh, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. Pardon me. You have to prioritize the stuff into the have to do. Writing has to be a have to. It it doesn't it, it can't be a get to. I didn't write twenty one books. with with uh, have to this and have to that and not including um, God Jennifer books above my nine to five job my nine to five job is something so that I can provide for Jennifer my wife but what's more important than that is writing it's because writing uh, it I'm I've, I've created a tiny employee and this tiny employee goes into the future and he will, he will continue to create wealth for me when I am invalid at 95 in a home or at whatever point I'm at. My grandchildren can go to college, perhaps, if this is enough quality, if people like it. Uh, so with each tiny employee that we create, uh, we are paving for ourselves a better future. Sure wish we would have done that 20 years ago. If I was this committed 20 years ago, who knows where I would be? Uh, like Jesus said, even though it's hard for you, you have to be willing to lay things down. Obviously, you writing the story doesn't have to include leaving your family, but it does have to, a lot to say about serious commitment that it entails. <clears throat> uh, building a creative nook, a safe place, a writer's place to call home. My wife recently bought a pet fox. My life is hell. I have no. There's a wild animal in my house. Um, it's still a. It's still a Todd. It's still a, a a kit. So it's not a Todd, but it turns that into October, and then hopefully it calms down. But it still runs around the house. And it yes, uh, today it ate my internet cable, so I had to go purchase a new internet cable. But my quiet place um, is uh, with my headphones on, sitting in literally in a corner of of, of the living room, uh, just with my head close, close to the screen as I can, because if I look around, uh, I'm going to find that he just ate my favorite shirt or something. Actually, he ate my wife's favorite shirt yesterday, uh, and her favorite pajamas the day before that. So he's going through an eating of the clothes phase, which is just, bleh. so <clears throat> your nook, your writing spot, your, your, uh, your place to carve out this, this work from granite, uh, it doesn't have to be spectacular. You know, you don't have to have like Fox Mulder's basement, you know, office posters everywhere and pencils in the ceiling and you don't have to have it, but it's got to be yours. You know, you've got to have the the place where you can say this is mine and no one else's. This is this is the spot where, where I can birth my baby book, you know, me and the book. This is our this is our 
come together spot. Uh, Tracy, do you have a spot like that in your house? I have two spots. Two I have spots. A spot outside and I have a spot inside. Two spots, one outside and one inside. When the weather's nice, I'm outside. And when the weather's not, I'm inside. But it's every day. It's every day. Basically from approximately 11 o'clock in the morning until 1.30. Okay, 11 a.m. to 1.30. And then I stopped at eat. Okay, and then you're and done. Then, then I'm done from writing, but my brain never shuts off. Okay. I'm constantly thinking about other things and making notes. And making notes. Maybe she should have said this when the, yeah. Or whatever to go back to do, a, to do an edit or, you know, I'll, this one here, I, I think I want to work a sequel on, and, and I, I want to do this and this and this with that character. So your brain never stops so, churning. So yeah. It's, just, it's always churning. Yeah. Are your characters that you. Some of my friends, some of the characters were people that my past, let me change the names. Of okay. the change the names. They were in your past, yes. yes. Uh, some of them, we actually <laughs> use names of people in the past, and have completely changed their characters in the way I wish that they were. I see. Yeah. Brian has a story about that. Um, yeah. He's fiction about um, some sadomasochism stuff, and I don't want to name the names of the books because I hate them so much. <laughs> yes, that. so it's, it, 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 it does work. Now, what I've done in the past is I've taken famous people like Frankenstein or Zorro, and I've given them names like Jim and Ted and Ted runs in and saves the day and then high fives the wall with a painted red hand and left his mark, you know, you know, something very similar, but no one can say, Oh yeah, that was uh, me in high school or so I'll never get sued, but, but it's Zorro. Uh, so I've done things like that. I've stolen famous characters. Didn't they, you know, his name is a Tarzan, but his name was, you know, Fernando or whatever, but he still, he was raised by monkeys. So, uh, it's 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 very easy. Um, so again, letting your story write itself, you must be willing to give up popular opinions about who you think you are and your, who you're perceived as. Uh, people don't know me through my writing. They know me through knowing me. Um, I some collections um, and I had a girl, Sonia. And she came up to me. She says, oh, I love your stuff. It's so wonderful. And she was just idolizing who she thought I was. She had pedestalized me. Um, and as I am not a lech, I did not take advantage of that situation. Thank you. Uh, but I did tell her. Uh, so that's not me. That's just a piece. That's a part. It's a, it's a thing that I've done. It's like, you know, fall in love with the construction worker who built your home. It's not him. It's just something he did with his hands. Uh, so when he, when, uh, Jesus looked down into your mother's womb, he knew exactly the person who you were to become. And more importantly, exactly the person you had the potential to become. So the potentiality of you becoming a better writer is you understanding that you always can be better and a better writer. So you relinquish control of the great unknown. That's never the issue. Wrestle the great unknown is wrestling it, not relinquishing control until you're able to confront the unknown as an adversary as Sean Connery says in the Red October, Hunt for October, adversary, and tame it, the story will be unwilling to write itself. So never fear the unknown, because the blank page after what you just wrote is not the enemy. The enemy is yourself, and the enemy is little distractions, little things, and and time. You've got it. You've got to cut to the chase. So we have about 15 minutes left, and this is part five. Part five. You must not let, let the story write itself to find itself in the bargain bin. You must let the story write itself to find itself in the library. I know a lot of writers on Amazon.com who write garbage, and they write just to write, and they fill the books, the, the book aisle at the Amazon Fulfillment Store in Lexington, Kentucky, or wherever it is, uh, with just garbage paper garbage the tree made a sacrifice for that garbage or did it make a sacrifice for a good book uh there's a movie called finding forester have you guys seen this movie um it's a great movie if you guys have not seen the movie 
spoiler alert, it's about a guy who writes a book. And a young black man in, who lives in, in, in the black area of town, uh, Fort to be a black area of town. He's an old Scottish, Scottish man. I think Sean Connery pays a Scottish man. Uh, and it's called Finding Forrester. He, this young boy finds Forrester. And they ask him, or rather he poses the question to a class one day and says, everyone always asks me, why the one book? Well, I don't want to write one book. I didn't feel that any other book idea I had was worth it. So he wrote a bunch of, and he made his entire life's money off that one book. And it's like the guy who went around as a shoe salesman in the 1920s. Had one pair of shoes, diamond encrusted shoes. Door to door, every day of his life. Everyone loved him. And they asked him the price. Well, how much for your shoes? One million dollars. They'd all turn him down. And so he was asked why that price. He said, well, I just have to sell the one pair. So if you have that book that you've been working on, and uh, what is his name? Ernst Clive, the fellow who wrote uh, uh, Ready Player One. Uh, I'm gonna oh, I'm gonna slaughter this if I don't. Sorry, kids at home. Clive. Oh, Fishbosh, it's showing me the movie. Book. Ready Player One book. Author, Ernest Klein. I was so close. Ernest Klein. Ernest Klein. Ernest Klein wrote a book, Ready Player One. And his story is much the same as Jars of Clay music band. Uh, Ready Player One was a, uh, a really good book. And it sensation, and they bought the rights to it, and they, they made a movie, Ready Player One. And it's gorgeous. It's a gorgeous, beautiful book, um, and everyone here should read it. However, his new book, Armada, his second book, is complete trash. There is nothing wholesome about this book. He copy and pastes every TV trope and movie trope and just throws it in this book, hoping to make it a success. He, in the book, mentions three times Ender's Game. And what is the book? It's basically just a copy of Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card. Uh, he had a great idea with Ready Player One. He probably worked on it a very long time. He put a lot of thought into it. He probably reworked and reworked the opening um, paragraph and the opening page, the opening chapter, a hundred times. But with Armada, he rushed it, and it was garbage. And Ernest, if you're watching this, I love your work. Your first book, I read it one day, and I read it again the, the next week, and it's amazing. Uh, the movie did you wrong. I'm sorry. That's just how it happened. The movie is garbage as well. Uh, they didn't have all the rights to all the cool stuff, so they put the Iron Giant in it, and it just it was horrible. And the last 20 seconds in the movie, well, but, but, as writers, when we work on our first script, just like Jars of Clay's first album, all the all the rights were sold to every song on that album, and then their second and third albums were trashed. The band broke up. Uh, we have to keep on keeping on, push, 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 make it. Make it wonderful. We can't release uh, uh, a Tucker car. We can't have a prototype go out there, followed by another prototype with variations, followed by another prototype. We have to make our book because no one knows. I mean, yeah. So, Polly, when's your first book coming out? <laughs> they're going to do that to you. They might not call you Polly, but they're going to do that to you uh, for years and years and years. But when you publish your first book, just like Marty McFly, uh, well, hey, <laughs> or what did he do? Oh, 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 oh. I can't do the Marty McFly left. Uh, at the very end of the of the first of the first Back to the Future, uh, he was so happy and so proud, and, and he was a, he was a sensation. So aim for perfection because you'll hit imperfection every time. But if you aim for imperfection, you'll you'll just be in the the, the slump, the, the garbage, the sewer. Okay, part five. Is, here's a quote by Enid Bagnold, and I don't know who Enid Bagnold is, but it's a good quote. Uh, I think she's a blogger. Who wants to become a writer and why? Because it's the answer to everything. 
It's the streaming reason for living, to note, to pin down, to build up, to create, to be astonished at nothing, to cherish the oddities, to let nothing go down the drain, to make something, to make a great flower out of life, even if it's a cactus. The story will write itself when the characters in the story are writing the story in place of the story writing itself. So when your characters become alive, then the story happens. There's life in your story or it will be dead by before it hits the stands. Don't confuse the plot. Sometimes what seems to be a great idea in your story is just another story waiting to be written. Like when Tracy thinks about all this stuff. Who is she? She is the author of National Velvet. No, the author of National Velvet. Probably a New York Best Times seller. Uh, she is Enid Algernon Bagnell, Lady Jones, CBE. CBE. Mm. Yes. Uh, 1889, Manchester, uh, United Kingdom. Okay. So you're close. She's a very famous historical author who I do not know of. Yes. Okay. So, a great quote. okay, here's what I promised you earlier. When I talked about your, your catch all folder, HP Lovecraft had something in his back pocket every day. HP Lovecraft, the commonplace story. And it was just a little tiny journal. And he would write in it, a reindeer comes from the fog and becomes a vampire. And that's all he would do. He would just write these weird ideas, you know. I fell down the staircase and wound up in hell. Uh, you know, if you want to hear some weird ideas, uh, and again, one of my heroes, Stephen King, read the short story collection, Skeleton Crew. Uh, amazing, amazing. The rats in the basement one. Blows me away. I can't get enough of that story. Um, you have to keep all of your ideas. Uh, Tracy was <coughs> telling me a story where he he and another uh, actor were two secondary and tertiary actors. And the main actor of this scene was supposed to be in a card game, and they were all three playing cards, and he had 90% of the dialogue. Uh, so what happened was the curtain opened, and that main man wasn't there. He was sitting uh, off to the stage at, behind the curtains. They called in the wings. And uh, so Tracy and the, uh, the oh, is John on the toilet? Well, where's John? And, and they kept waiting for John and waiting for John and waiting for John, and he never showed up. But they were able to piece together the main parts of his speech so that the, play, the show could go on. Nothing about anything is commonplace. Uh, something like this happens, and you're like, my main idea is missing, but I can cobble together something and then make it work, and then keep writing. Keep, 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 keep writing. Now, later, during your edit phase, you'll find John, you'll pull him from the wings, you'll sit him down. Sometimes you're like, <clears throat> I know I'm missing something. I'm an idiot. I'm a fool. And you'll be at Denny's getting a salad. I don't know why you're at Denny's getting a salad. It's a bad place to get a salad, but there you are. There you are at Denny's getting a salad, and, and you find yourself overhearing a snippet of a conversation from two tables away, and they say something that sparks the imagination in you. And you're like, ha, that's it. Let me get my, and you write it down. Glean from everyone. Glean from every situation. Tracy is using that scene and putting it into a new play. This, this part of his life that was in another play is now becoming part of a new play. He's, it's more, it's more of an art form to, to uh, make those old fashioned limestone chimneys out of those rocks that mismatch. And you're like, how did they sit there? They just, they sat there. They're like an autistic child with Legos. Oh, oh, I'll just do this and this and this. So sometimes cobbling is more important than, uh, than the hard work that we do because it's, it's genius. You're like, wow. That fit together so well. Stephen King says, the road to hell is paved with adverbs. Trying to become a great writer is like trying to become Mount Everest. You can't try to become a great writer. You either are or you are not. I'm going to close with um, part five with this. Madeline Engel. Added to the assumption that if you don't have enough talent to write for adults, you must try to write a book for children is the further insult that if you really work hard and discover that you have more talent than you thought you had, you might advance enough to write a book for adults. <clears throat> if you are not good enough to write a book for adults, you're certainly not good enough to write a book for children. 
So don't ever limit yourself. Don't ever limit your audience. Limiting yourself and your audience is probably the biggest fallacy you could ever do. Your audience is just basically you outside of your body. We have five minutes for part six. So it's going to be a whirlwind. But I will read a couple of things. Michelle Richmond says, outlines are fine unless they derail with you. I've seen it time and time again. Writers who end up spinning their wheels for years beholden to a failed outline. You know what an outline is. This, 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 and here's the end. The best thing about an outline is that it's limit. The, the bad thing about an outline is that it limits your novel's possibilities. And for the first 50 pages, at least, write without an outline. Work without an outline. Say you have an idea and you just spit it out there. And then you're like, oh, I think it should be this. Put an outline down there. Um, I would say that there are two different types of writers, those who are the outline people and those who are the archaeologists. And this is, again, Stephen King's um, – are you an outline guy? Yeah. Okay. This I is – Outline and pencil because it changed, changed Outline and pencil? Yeah. There you go. Change the outline because yeah. Change the outline as the story develops. So you've learned. Yes. You've learned that the bad outline can limit you right. because – it gets you started. It gets you started. Yes. I do. There's a lot of roads you can take from Chicago to Louisville. You just don't have to be on 65. Yeah. So you might draw 65, but then all of a sudden you're burying off on the, all these little side parts, and the story gets much more interesting. Tracy, Tracy just said there's a lot of routes you can take from Chicago to Louisville, but if you draw 65, you can take 65, like Jack London would, you know, there you go, there's the story. Uh, or you can get off on the side, like Juliet Marlinier, who I was telling uh, you about earlier. Great oats and, and like with oh, yeah. And have a sandwich, you can take, and then take, take one of the back roads. You, know? you can take a plane from Chicago to Louisville, or you could take a bicycle. What is the story about? Is it about um, uh, is it about a hijacker who wants to kill the world and blow it up? Then you need Tom Cruise in your plane, you know, flying upside down and crashing and parachutes. And, or is it about uh, a, a brother and sister reuniting with their long lost mother um, and they meet their aunt along the way? And you know, whatever the story is, as long as you're getting from point A to point B, um, it's up to you. What's the best route for a story is whatever the story demands. Uh, <clears throat> let reality be reality, though. No one likes the super lucky hero, you know. No one likes to finish the end of a sci-fi movie with time travel. Come on, time travel is the worst offense to a to a to a sci-fi lover. Oh, uh, uh, all this stuff happened. All the well, I'll just time travel backwards and fix it all. You can't fix the end. The evil genius spills out the whole plan to to miss, to, uh, to James Bond before he kills him. The other guy listening in, you know, is able to turn off the switch. Nobody likes those things. You have to let reality be reality. Uh, my favorite thing is uh, from any movie, Jackie Chan, uh, when he's fighting the bad guys, he will trip and, you know, land goofy or the thing he's trying to whack him with breaks. Uh, so you always have to have reality, reality. And with that, my friends, uh, let's let's basically recap. We talked about... Part six. Part six was the story should write itself naturally. Part five, you must let the story write itself and not to find itself in the bargain bin, but to find itself in the library. So you have to have quality. Part four, as we go back, is more important than that silly reality. So you have to carve out your life around your writing, create tiny employees. Part three, your story writes itself when you submit to the task daily, every day, one hour, two hours. They start with 15 minutes. I'm going to write for 15 minutes a day. And as you continue, you'll find, yeah, I fulfilled my 15 minutes, but today I wrote more. Don't increase that more automatically for the next day. Keep your 15 minutes for a while until you continually add the more. If you add too quickly, then you're going to disappoint yourself. Sorry, I didn't say that first. Part two, your story will write itself when you understand the goal of the writer is to present the story, not to sell the book. In part one, your story will write itself when you understand the goal of writing should be about life fulfillment. And we'll read that 
quote by Aristotle again to close our talk today. What is the ultimate purpose of human existence, says Aristotle? What is that end or goal for which we should direct all of our activities? Everywhere we see people seeking pleasure, wealth, and a good reputation. But while each of these has some value, none of them can occupy the place of the chief good for which humanity should aim. To be an ultimate end, an act must be self-sufficient and final. That which is always desirable in itself and never for the sake of something else. So that's our talk for the day, how to write your, let your story write itself. My name is Polly Hart. Tracy Rosa with PegasusE&E.com, Pegasus Entertainment and Events. That is him. He is with one of our uh, attendees today. Brian K. Morris, you'll find him at Rising Tide Publications. Rising Tide.pub. Rising Tide.pub. And Cookie, his wonderful, wonderful wife. And you are, are you, do you advertise your business online? I put that on hold. Okay. She okay. works for risingtide.pub. Right. She works also with risingtide.pub. But if you ever need someone to make you a Superman cape, I do know a lady. All right. Thank you very much. My name is Polly Hart. You guys have been great. I love you all, and you all have a wonderful, wonderful day.